On the 28th of May 2002, the English Football Association approved a decision to allow Wimbledon FC to relocate to Milton Keynes. The move took them 90 kilometres from their home at Plough Lane and saw them renamed the Milton Keynes Dons. This decision came after years of ground sharing and uncertainty, dating back to 1991 when Wimbledon left Plough Lane. Following the move, the majority of Wimbledon FC's original supporters defected to newly formed Phoenix club AFC Wimbledon, claiming the history and story of Wimbledon FC as their own. In Milton Keynes, the newly named MK Dons would fail to match the heights which had been achieved in Wimbledon. By the 2002 season, the club had fallen to League One, and the club marked its move to Milton Keynes by being relegated further to League Two. Since the club's movement and renaming, they have spent the majority of their time languishing in League One, with just the occasional championship appearance to their name. And things were no better off the pitch, with many fans refusing to recognise MK Dons as a club. The supporters club were denied entry to the Football Supporters Federation, a federation which appealed for other fans to boycott MK Dons matches until 2006 when they agreed to return the club's FA Cup trophy and patrimony to the London Borough of Merton. But all of this very nearly didn't happen. While a number of ideas were presented to provide Wimbledon FC with a home during the 90s, there was one idea which came a lot closer to reality than the rest. An idea which would have changed the face of football forever. In 1991, Wimbledon FC left their home at Plough Lane, deeming it beyond redevelopment, and began ground sharing with Crystal Palace at Selhurst Park. With plans on building an all-seater stadium and the club's home of Merton falling through, the search began for a new home for Wimbledon FC. By 1994, Wimbledon remained homeless, despite the interest of a number of parties. But there was one party who would soon present Wimbledon owner Sam Hammam with a very interesting offer. In Ireland, property developer Owen O'Callaghan and event entrepreneur Tommy Higgins were unveiling plans for the development of a brand new stadium in Dublin. So um, I met Owen at the, at the opening, I said I'd be interested in the ticketing contract, so he asked me down to Cork. And we went through all the different things, and he wanted to put in different concerts when there wasn't. Well, he was hoping to bring in the rugby and the, the soccer. But one thing I noticed with Owen's uh, setup that he had no anchor tenant. In the, in the, he was trying to get this in. I said, it's going to be difficult if you're going to be dependent on concerts and stuff and putting up a 40,000 seat or beautiful stadium. So a couple of weeks later, or a couple of months later, I was reading the Sunday Times and there was a big article on Wimbledon football club with Sam Hammam. And he was having difficulty with Merton Council because uh, he had a small rundown stadium because he brought that team from non-league right up to the Premier League, a huge achievement. So <clears throat> I said, well, there's a man looking for a ground and Noel O'Callaghan is looking for a tenant. For Higgins and O'Callaghan, this was a match made in heaven. Together with fellow Dublin entrepreneur Morris Cassidy, Higgins and O'Callaghan made initial contact with Wimbledon, proposing this idea. While Hammam showed interest in the idea, he ultimately said no to the prospect of moving to Ireland. But undeterred by the initial refusal, six months later an Irish consortium of Owen O'Callaghan, Tommy Higgins, Morris Cassidy and former U2 manager Paul McGuinness came together, hoping to make an Irish Premier League dream reality. The Irish Consortium was to be represented in the media by Eamon Dunphy, former Irish international and at the time high profile journalist. Their aim was to secure a deal which would bring Wimbledon and the Premier League to Dublin. Well, Wimbledon isn't coming in. I mean, a partnership between um, Irish people and the Hammams will create a new club, which will be an Irish club uh, owned by Irish people, for Irish people to watch and for Irish players. And so, Ireland has the opportunity to be a first world football country. Through Eamon Dunphy, the consortium were able to win over then Wimbledon manager Joe Kinnear, Dunphy's former international teammate. And with Dunphy in his ear, it wasn't long before Kinnear was going to Hammam, and Hammam began showing more interest in the Irish consortium's proposal. Six months following the initial contact, Sam Hammam came to Ireland to discuss the proposal with the Irish consortium, and ultimately they came to an agreement. Hammam would sell 75% of the club to the consortium for £6 million, giving the consortium ownership but allowing Hammam to remain in his position at the club. With an agreement in place, the consortium began laying its plans for the move. It was agreed that the club would be renamed once it came to Ireland. The Dublin Dons and Dublin City FC were two of the names which were in the mix. For the consortium, the task now was difficult, but not impossible. All the consortium had to do was bring FIFA, UEFA, the FAI, the League of Ireland, the English FA and the Premier League on board. While this would seem a task of gargantuan proportion, the consortium had one major factor on their side. The ace in the sleeve for the Irish consortium came in December of 1995. It was then that the European Court of Justice ruled that Belgian footballer Jean-Marc Bosman could leave his club on a free transfer when his contract expired. 
This was a decision that provided precedent that football was a business, and therefore the factors within it were entitled to the same rights as any other industry. For the Irish Consortium, this ruling would prove to be crucial in overcoming many of the barriers which would have prevented the movement of Wimbledon FC to Ireland previously. It was after the Bosman ruling, which is now operational, and the key factor in the Bosman ruling was that the Footballing Authority's case was that this was a sporting matter, and therefore he was bound by sporting rules. And the European Court of Justice disagreed. They said that football is a business, and therefore the rules that apply in business have to apply in football. Hence, Bosman was free. And that changed the whole landscape in football. And if you applied the Bosman ruling to the idea of Wimbledon having a home in Dublin, it was clear, trying to stop that would be the same as trying to stop Marks and Spencers opening a branch. By the opening day of the Premier League in 1996, everything seemed to be on track for the consortium. They were invited to watch the first game of the season against Manchester United, a game famous for David Beckham's goal from the halfway line. Here they were spotted at the ground, and when they were spotted with Hamam, the public realised that this move might actually happen. All that stood in the consortium's way now were the respective governing bodies. In the autumn of 1996, the consortium held a press conference and unveiled their plans for the world to see, a world which was not exactly keen on the idea. I do remember, I think, that everyone didn't stand up and give us a standing ovation and say, that's great, lads. <laughs> I think there may have been a bit of that about it. And I think uh, it was sort of small town thinking, really. I was mad for it, and lots of people I knew were mad for it uh, when you explained it to them. But I suppose people come up with gimmicks all the time or pull rabbits out of hats that turn out to be not rabbits. But we'd spent a long time, and I'd spent a very long time, making sure that in detail we had everything, with all the sort of ducks in a row, with the exception of an FAI sanction, go for it. The Premier League had committed, uh, provided everyone else was on side. Yeah, I mean, it was... I, there's no point in denying it. I mean, the, the hostility towards it was depressing. Knowing that they needed the agreement of the FAI and the League of Ireland, the consortium put together a support package for the League in an attempt to entice the League of Ireland clubs. This package included a lump sum of reported £2 million to be given to the League of Ireland, and some reports suggest this figure could have risen as far as £10 million. Despite this package, both League of Ireland clubs and their fans were not happy, leading to the creation of the National League United by disgruntled League of Ireland fans. The National League United felt that the introduction of an English club to Ireland would completely destroy the Irish domestic league, and the concern of these fans was clear with hundreds meeting the band together against the consortium and make their feelings clear to the world. It quickly became clear that the consortium had not considered the League of Ireland fans to be an obstacle to their plans, yet the belief of the Irish consortium remained that this would only be a positive move for Irish football. I could see on a certain level how they'd feel threatened. Who's going to come to our, our matches? if there's a big Dublin Dons match every two weeks, but that's, it's, it's natural, but it, it's not really, you know, if you look at the evidence of a big player coming into any retail thing, and that's what you're doing with football, you're selling a product, it's a rising tide all boats rise. For the League of Ireland fans, the fact that it was Eamon Dunphy bringing the proposal did not help. Dunphy had made his disdain for the Irish Domestic League very clear in the past and was not well liked amongst the League of Ireland faithful for his derisory remarks regarding the state of Irish football. Another thing that kind of roiled supporters of football, Irish football, was the fact that Eamon was involved in it because he hated the League of Ireland. He would no time for the League of Ireland uh, and he'd make that quite clear. For the newly appointed CEO of the FAI, Bernard O'Byrne, the move of Wimbledon to Ireland was immediately top priority and would remain so for the next 18 months. From the start, O'Byrne was not pleased with how the consortium attempted to implement their plans. It was his opinion that their backdoor approach created immediate enemies and actually turned potential supporters of the move against it. While things were heating up in Ireland, it was no different in London, as Wimbledon supporters began fighting to prevent the move from happening. The most notable of these protests came following a Premier League match against Manchester United in 1997, which saw supporters demonstrate for two hours following the final whistle. 
The sequel was a demonstration by close on a thousand Wimbledon supporters, upset not by defeat, but at the reappearance of suggestions that the club might relocate to Ireland. Wimbledon owner Sam Hamam went into the crowd to make his point, but it took over an hour to clear the crowd. In an interview given following the game, Owen O'Callaghan made it clear that the consortium had little understanding of why the Wimbledon fans were fighting. OK, let me go to Owen O'Callaghan on that. The core support in Wimbledon, what about them? Yes, well, I don't agree that the core support is 15,000. I think it's closer to 6 or 7,000. Are you wrong, uh, but anyway, what about them? I mean, presumably they're not going to be overly pleased by this. Well, you you two two situations there. First of all, um, Wimbledon do not have their own stadium or their own pitch in, in London. Mm -hmm. They they rent the a pitch, as you know, in Sellers Park, Cormac. Um, I know, yeah. Um, and I believe the Wimbledon team and the Wimbledon supporters would like to have their own club. Now, Dublin isn't that far from London. Newcastle, I believe, is every bit as far, if not further away. So the, the distance in this modern day is not a problem. And if, if Wimbledon's home supporters are prepared to, if, if they're prepared to travel to the places like Newcastle, Leeds, etc., etc., surely they'll travel to Dublin as well. Even with the FAI and League of Ireland refusing to accept the proposal, the consortium were confident that if they had to, they could go to the European courts and win. But this road would have meant years of legal battles, a path which the consortium did not want to take. For their plan to work, they would have to win the hearts and minds of the general public. While the consortium were struggling to generate mass appeal for their plans, the Wimbledon side of the deal had begun to go cold. As time went on, Hammam's price began to increase, and soon contact between the parties began to slow down. By mid-1997, things were not looking good for the Irish consortium. Well, the fact that I, I had figured out that it had, it had gone to ground, you know, and I've been involved in deeds before where things just run into the sand and it doesn't happen. And the fact that they weren't engaged, we were suspicious. We were suspicious at the time, and uh, they were stopped. They weren't uh, answering phone calls or any stuff the solicitor would send over. Uh, they would not. Uh, they would not reply to it. Something was up at the time. We tried contact, and they never came back to us. So it just went dead at that stage. About six months following the slowdown of contact, the unthinkable happened. Consortium member Tommy Higgins was on his way through Gatwick Airport when he saw on the news that Hammam had sold Wimbledon to two Norwegian investors for a sum of £26 million, over four times higher than what had been agreed with the consortium. Despite this major blow, there was a glimmer of hope for the consortium, who attempted to strike a deal with Norwegian investors who had shown a renewed interest in bringing the club to Dublin. But the final glimmers of hope were crushed when at the 1998 FIFA AGM, FIFA reiterated that no club could move countries without the approval of both football associations. Ultimately, Ireland never got their Premier League club, a move which would no doubt have sent shockwaves through world football. The move may have prompted a franchise model in European football, similar to that seen in the United States, and could even have sped up the creation of a European Super League. Unfortunately for Wimbledon, despite their temporary victory against the Irish consortium, their club was still torn out of their hands and moved to Milton Keynes, despite the persistent efforts of their supporters. Thankfully, the remarkable rise of AFC Wimbledon has provided those supporters with a local club that now competes on the same level as the one franchised to Milton Keynes. For the League of Ireland, nothing much has changed since 1998. It remains underfunded and undersupported. It's impossible to tell the impact which the Dublin Dons would have had on Irish football, but the events remain a victory for Irish fans and a reminder that the fans' voice is still the most important in the game. And despite their failure, members of the consortium still feel that victory was in their grasp, right up until the very end. I, it was definitely worth trying, but the idea was right, and it's gone now. It's not going, never going to happen. Never going to happen again. It was, it was wonderful fun. Uh, we didn't spend an awful lot of money, and we threw a few, few grand into a, into a kitty for expenses, and but it, 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 it drifted away. In a nutshell, you're for it. You want it to happen. Yes. Yes, yes it will happen. There's a, an excellent chance now that it will happen and that uh, it will happen quite soon.